Welcome to the Palestine Podcast, produced by the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Hello, my name's Andrew Anderson. I'm the Executive Director of Frontline Defenders, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2020 Dublin Arts and Human Rights Festival. Along with our partners, Smashing Times, Amnesty, Fighting Words, ICCL, the National Women's Council and Trocra, we're hosting a 10-day festival to highlight the extraordinary work of human rights defenders around the world, to showcase the vibrancy of the human rights work that's happening in Ireland and the role of the arts and artists in promoting human rights today. The theme of this year's festival is Voices of Hope, Courage and Resilience, celebrating human rights and linking the arts to civil society and active citizenship. And we're pleased to be able to bring you this panel that addresses the transnational targeting of human rights defenders working to advance human rights in Palestine. At a time when Palestinian human rights defenders face shrinking digital and physical space, for their activism. Providing this platform is critical to supporting human rights defenders at risk. We are very grateful for the participation of Senator Francis Black, who has championed human rights in Palestine as part of her work in the Irish Senate, following her own visit to the occupied territories. Following her exclusive interview, the panel moderated by Hawaii Araf will include Mahmoud Nawaja, on whose case frontline defenders recently advocated, including a letter to the editor published in the Irish Times, as well as Dima Khalidi and Majed Abdusalama, who will help us understand the way that efforts are deployed to silence Palestinian and Palestine solidarity rights defenders in the US and Europe. Thank you, Andrew. Hello and welcome everyone to this panel targeting in transnational activism for Palestinian rights. Uh, we thank Frontline Defenders and all of the sponsors for this. As you heard, we have a brilliant panel for you today uh, covering the activist, legal, and political arenas on this issue of attacks on Palestinian activism. So there is not much need for me to do much talking. But briefly, let me say, you know, it's unfortunate that human rights are not a, a common denominator for all of us. Perhaps for all of us gathered here, it is. But around the world, we know that there's still widespread denial of basic rights due to fears and personal interests, racism, xenophobia, homophobia, corporate greed, religious strife, sectarianism, political power, and the list goes on and on. And at the same time, we have individuals around the world that find themselves thrown into this role of human rights defenders for standing up against these forces that deny people basic rights and paying a heavy price for it. In some countries, it's intolerant groups threatening human rights defenders. In other places, it's transnational corporations. And many times, it's the state itself. In the case of Israel, it's not frequently seen that, it's not frequently put in the category of these states that target human rights defenders, partly because of the way that Israel has portrayed itself, its sophisticated uh, public relations, its diplomatic relations, its projection of itself as a democracy and quote unquote, the only democracy in the region, its promotion of its court systems and, and the list goes on. But what we do find when we peel back the veneer, and I would argue that the veneer has become very thin, that it is targeting human rights defenders in all spheres, whether legal, political, social, and not just in the country and in the occupied Palestinian territories, but across the globe through its relations and its extensive network uh, with corporations, with politicians, and, um, and with activists. Even with this panel, we tried repeatedly to promote it on Facebook and were rejected a few times. So we'll get into this uh, as we talk about it, but, you know, some will fight this, this panel and this 
uh, and argue that we are trying to, we are singling out Israel. But what we're actually doing is saying that Israel is not exceptional in the realm of, of countries that do attack human rights defenders to promote its personal agenda. And in the case of Israel, it's been insidious. It doesn't get the attention that it needs. And we're hoping that this panel can help shed a little bit of light on that. First, let me go to um, Sandra Francis Black. She couldn't be here with us today, but I had a wonderful interview with her yesterday, which we recorded for you. Sandra Black is an independent senator, singer, and founder of the Rise Foundation, which is a charitable organization working with people that have a loved one in addiction. She's a strong advocate for social, ju social justice and equality. Uh, she was elected to the 25th Senate in 2016, the first female independent from the Senate's panel system in the history of the state. She is passionate about being a voice for the vulnerable and continues to work with organizations in the voluntary and charitable sectors uh, in addition to her incredible work in the Senate. So here's a little bit uh, from Francis Black. Senator Black, thank you so much for being with us. Um, let me jump right into it. Can you please explain to us the key provisions of the Occupied Territories Bill? Of course. Well, um, I introduced the Occupied Territories Bill in, into our parliament in 2018. Um, the bill seeks to end Irish trade in goods produced in the illegal settlements in the occupied territories. So we're not talking about Israeli goods here. We're talking about goods produced in the illegal settlements beyond Israel's borders in Palestine. Um, these settlements are totally illegal under international law. Um, they're actually war crimes. Um, and the UN, the EU, the Irish government keep saying they're illegal. But despite this, the settlements continue to be built, taken slowly Palestinian land. They extract valuable natural resources and agricultural produce, which are exported and sold around the world. Now, I believe there's a clear hypocrisy here. I mean, how can we condemn the settlements as illegal as theft of land and resources, but then happily, happily buy the proceeds of crime? In the West Bank, we know that families are kicked out of their homes. Fertile farming land is taken. Fruit and vegetables produced are exported. Uh, to pay for the occupation. So if we're paying for these goods, we're supporting the theft, I believe, of Palestinian land, and it just isn't right. Thank you. And I do want to get more into the, um, the position of the Irish government and what happened. But before that, I wanted to ask you what motivated you to bring this bill forward. Um, well, I've always, um, in my previous life, and I still am a performer, a musician, um, and I've always been, I suppose, very, um, I'm an activist as well. Before I got into politics, I've always been very um, engaged in what was happening over in, in, in the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, and um, I suppose when I got into Leinster House in 2016, when I when I got elected into the, into the parliament, I... Um, I got a phone call from one of the other members asking me would I consider becoming the chair of the Friends of Palestine Committee. Um, and I was very honored to do so, which I did. And doing when you're um when you're the chair of, of a Friends of Palestine group like that, you obviously have to hold briefings and for other parliamentarians. So um I held one briefing where a young man called Mohammed came over um, and spoke about for him. Uh, what was happening and what happened to his land um, and I just felt we needed to do something to it was very very moving and really I suppose the hopelessness that came through for me was um, really devastating so I there was a young uh, lawyer there called Jerry Liston and Jerry and myself and um, my PA Connor O'Neill decided that we would look at a piece of legislation and it was Jerry who suggested this piece of legislation and then we started to work really hard on it and both Jerry and Connor would sit up for many hours to early morning sometimes making sure that this bill was watertight and that um, we were doing it the right way. Well thank you for all your work on that it is definitely needed and we need more of it but coming to what actually happened and the position of the Irish 
government that you told us about vis-a-vis -vis settlement, um, despite the election results and what seemed to be an agreement to implement the bill, it was left out of the announced agreement forming the current government. And yeah. despite widespread uh, public support for it in Ireland, why do you think there was a block? Uh, or do you know what happened? Well, there's, there's been many reasons, um, you know, like why this bill hasn't been put forward um, and, and hadn't passed, despite the, the support that we had in Ireland. Now, we had a general election in February. Um, this changed the landscape somewhat. Our new coalition government has, has a majority now, um, and it consists of three parties, two which had supported the bill, Fianna Fáil and the Green Party, and one which opposed, which was Fianna Gael. And despite agreeing with the principle of the ban, they claimed it raised issues regarding e EU law. Um, the compromise struck between the three parties, but that while the new government have not explicitly committed to progressing the Occupied Territories Bill over its final few hurdles and into law, they have instead promised to ensure respect for international law and move to a more proactive approach at, at national level measures to oppose annexation and settlement expansion. Um, the rep I will say this, the bill remains on the agenda and my team and all the campaigners in Ireland fully intend uh, on pushing it and holding this government to their promises. And now with regard to the EU law piece, I just want to, um, I suppose, the Irish government, you know, their argument has, they have said we can't do this under, under EU law. This is now the previous government, the Fianna Gael government. Um, and I had spoken at length with to the minister on this, and I know that we can absolutely do this as an EU member. And I have, I have shared detailed um, a legal opinions from some of the most eminent lawyers in the world. One of them, Cambridge University professor James Crawford, Who's an actual, he's actually a sitting judge um, at the ICJ. And we also have support from former Attorney General Michael McDowell. Um, the key legal point is simple. Under, e, under the EU treaties, Ireland can introduce limited proportional restrictions on things like settlement goods because they are produced as a result of illegal activity. And the EU says the settlements violate international law. So we can do this. Um, because we need to ensure international humanitarian law and human rights are respected. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, it does, or it gives a little bit of an insight. I know that UN Special Rapporteur for the Occupied Palestinian Territory, Michael Link, uh, mm -hmm. advised also, quote, he said, amongst the measures which states must adopt to meet the international law, to meet their international law obligations is a ban on trade with Israel's illegal settlements. Yeah. And so it seems like the UN Special Rapporteur is actually advising that states do this. Um, do you have plans to try to advance this bill or this measure any further after what happened? Well, we've already spoken to, we've been in, co in contact with parliamentarians um, in Norway, in Belgium, in um, Westminster. Um, we've actually been invited over to Chile um, and we spoke with parliamentarians there who were considering uh, introducing this bill into into their parliament and um, i really think you know that this message it sends to all people who are standing up for human rights like it, it's not a marathon it's a sprint and there will be setbacks no doubt about it along along the way um and uh, i i i feel that the bill is relatively mild it could be a significant milestone in the struggle for Palestinian rights. That's that's my strong belief. The opposition to this bill shows us how effective it could be. So, um, you know, sometimes a small gesture can have a significant impact on global politics. Um, we're all aware of the action taken by shop workers here in Ireland when they refused to handle oranges uh, from apartheid South Africa back in the 80s. Um, and how this has been hailed as an important event in the struggle to end apartheid uh, in that country. So, so I, I, my hope is that other countries will follow suit. And there has been a huge interest for sure. That's great. Thank you for the work also in promoting uh, what you're doing, what you're trying to do in Ireland to, mm -hmm. to other countries.
My last question for you is on uh, the targeting of activists in this area. Now, this panel is on the targeting of transnational defenders of Palestinian rights. And while your capacity is not that of an activist, the bill itself has been called anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you yourself have faced such allegations. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about your experience with this, um, if any, if you've had, if you've been attacked for advancing this bill and speaking up on behalf of Palestinian rights? And, um, and, and if you can also add to that any observations of what human rights defenders who advocate for Palestinian rights face. Um, including or especially if and how they're targeted in Europe? Sure. I mean, look, of course, I've received abuse um, and been accused of being anti-Semitic, which I am not. I need to say that I'm not anti-Semitic and the bill is not anti-Semitic. The bill is, is, you know, is asking countries to uphold international law. There's a real distinction between being against the illegal actions of the Israeli state and being anti-Semitic. Um, I've also, you know, I just want to say I've also re re received huge support from Israeli citizens who believe that the settlements and the proposed annexation of parts of the West Bank are illegal and will not contribute to the security of their people. But what I will say is, I know the, the abuse I have gotten certainly online has been, um, I suppose, pretty intense. But I know that I'm doing the right thing. Um, and I know that, you know, sometimes when as politicians um, or as activists, we will get abused for things that we believe in. Um, I don't let it impact me if, you know, because I know I'm doing the right thing. Um, so, you know, I know it can I know it can hurt people sometimes, particularly um, when you're being accused of something that you're not. But all we have to do is stay focused. We must stay focused on what the right thing to do here is um, and never give up, I suppose, the, the, the fight and continue to keep doing the right thing. And I think that's what drives me. I only have to answer to myself. I only have, and I, I feel I'm doing the right thing here. And I feel the people around me are doing the right thing. So we must stay focused on doing the right thing and um, I honestly, it doesn't impact me on a personal level. I just keep going. That's great. Well, we believe you're doing the right thing. And so many people thank you for it. And I've looked, uh, look up to you and look to you for it. And I think those of us who have faced similar know and sympathize. It is not, it is not easy to be accused of something that you're not, but um, we appreciate and admire your strength and more power to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for what you're doing. Please keep on. You have so many people around the world supporting you. Thank you. We keep going. And that was Senator Francis Black. And I, I hope as we move on in the discussion, we will, we will be able to discuss a little bit more um, actions that are being taken on the political level to advance Palestinian rights. But now to the esteemed panel that I have with me here today. I think I will introduce them one by one as I uh, pose the introductory question to them. So first I'm going to go to Mahmoud Nawaja. Mahmoud is a human rights defender and youth organizer from Hebron in the occupied Palestinian territory. He is general coordinator of the Boycott Divestment Sanction National Committee or the BNC. He is co-founder of the Palestinian Youth Forum, Al Muntada, and a board member of the Stop the Wall campaign. Welcome, Mahmoud. Thank Mahmoud, you. thank you for being here with us. If you would tell our audience, please, a little bit about what happened to you specifically a few months ago. Um, some people may have heard and others may not have heard that you were arrested. Uh, taken from your home in the middle of the night by Israeli forces. Can you fill us in on that? Yeah, thank you very much, Waida. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Frontline Defenders and all partner organization in, uh, in hosting such an amazing and important event. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, so, I mean, uh, what happened, 
to me is for the is for the Israeli government is just an uh, another person to be arrested, um, and we are having almost six thousand Palestinian prisoners, political prisoners in the Israeli prisons. Uh, so uh, after midnight, it was almost at dawn. I mean, there was like tens of Israeli soldiers with uh, with dogs. They, they uh, break into my my house. They terrified my uh, three children, and they took me uh, blindfolded and handcuffed from behind um, to a military uh, interrogation center uh, near Haifa. Um, it took us almost six hours to be there going from a uh, military uh, base to uh, to another. And that was, I mean, even transporting from here to, to there was uh, terribly. Uh, they put me in, uh, in a car, squeezed with all their equipment <laughs> on me. And then uh, when I reached that interrogation, interrogation center, they put me in a, in a tiny, tiny um, underground cell with no windows um, and they even built it in a way that there is a, a, a rough concrete uh, of the walls that you cannot even uh, uh, touch them in a way or, or another because they're really uh, tough and you cannot just lay down to any of that walls with a, uh, with a very large metal door that lead to another large metal, uh, metal door and then and then the cell. Um, so, so there you just cannot know if it's uh, day or night uh, because they keep confusing you with the, with the time and there's nothing uh, stable or organized in the way that you can see you can know if it's if it's day or or night and I think that is one of a part of their uh, techniques that they are they are using so um, I stayed there for almost 19 days of interrogation. Uh, I saw the sun for almost 10 minutes, no more than that. And that was when they take me, uh, when, when taken uh, to the military uh, court hearings. And even the military court, there was like a video conference only because the military court was in another, on another uh, uh, place. Um, uh, usually they interrogate me like for, for five to six hours per day. Uh, one of that day, they, they, um, they forced me to sit in a meter chair for 16, 16 hours. Um, that was a very painful position. Um, and then they take turns because, I mean, they won't stay uh, 16 hours with me, so they take turns yelling, threatening me. And they really threatened me with everything, even with my kids, that I will never see my kids uh, back again. And, and, and they're I mean, they start accusing me with a very baseless accusation. That was nothing uh, related uh, to me. And I know that there was nothing personal. It's about, <laughs> it's about the PTS movement uh, because they just want to harm the movement. They, are, they need to use me or someone else from the PTS movement leadership uh, to say that this movement is covering something, uh, something else. Um, they failed to diminish my will or my hope uh, because I and that 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 strength came from uh, my absolute belief in the justice of uh, of our and, and and my my cause, and because I really knew that there would there is a huge campaign that happening outside. There's no one told me about that, but I I knew that because I believe that all human rights defenders will stay together to defend each other, and that happens so to me. Sorry, so you yeah. were 19 days, and were you ever charged with anything? No, nothing. No, they, they just, they, they brought uh, some sort of a, not even what I usually say, not even a Hollywood uh, story. It was like a Bollywood story. I mean, of, of their imagination that I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And there's like baseless accusation that lead them to, uh, uh, to nothing. I mean, like even for the last for the last few days of the interrogation, they just put me in the cell, and they said we will just put you in the cell, and then from here you will go to prison. And there was nothing, and they prevent me from seeing my lawyer, um, and they prevent me from know anything. So that was like just blindfolded me all the time, 
and I mean, I think. Sorry, sorry you... like you said, uh, so many Palestinians are are subjected to similar over yeah. six thousand Palestinians now arrested. Uh, they don't get fair basic fair trial rights. And for you, it was intimidation. And 19 days you were released, so many Palestinians remain without charge for yes. much longer and can spend years. And you think it has to do with the public pressure campaign that was going on outside. Did I understand you correctly? Yes. I hope to talk yes, about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah I mean, I I mean, I mean that. yeah, that was, that was clear for me from even inside. I saw that, I mean, in the face of the interrogators, that there's something massive is happening outside. So I, I knew, and because I believe in the human rights defenders, I believe in the BDS movement, that something, I mean, a huge and massive uh, mobilization and lobbying would be ha happening outside. And that played a key role in releasing me because without that campaign, it will be easier for them to put me under administrative detention. And that is happening with too many, too many Palestinians because administrative detention is that they are just detaining Palestinians without any, uh, any charge or, or anything. And, and that campaign prevented men from, from, from doing this because they knew that if they took me that way, uh, the campaign will, be, uh, will become bigger and bigger and then we, they, will, they won't be able to, to, deal, to deal with it. And, and because of that campaign, I'm here, I'm here uh, uh, now. And I think they, they, they understand a very important lesson, that when a human rights defenders unite together, yeah. there is uh, uh, no government can stand against, against, uh, against them. I mean, this happened to me, and it was 19 days, and, and we have some other Palestinian who stayed for like 90 days in interrogation with, with no charge. I know a friend, uh, too many, too many of, of my friends, they stayed there for 40 days without charge and then they released them. I mean, this- And now we have uh, Maher al-Akhras that is still that is on hunger strike. In 90 yeah. days, I yeah. believe he's been on hunger strike protesting his detention. He's at 91 days now. Charge. 91 days. Um, I hope to get back to that and the role of uh, public pressure in uh, in campaigning for Palestinian rights and in pressuring Israel. But for now I want to also bring in uh, Majid Abu Salama to tell us. Hello. He's a PhD candidate in critical human geography and regional studies. Uh, in uh, He's a PhD candidate in Finland, but he is now based in Berlin. He is a, he was raised, born and raised in uh, Jabalia, refugee camp in Gaza, but I now said is based and joining us from Berlin. Uh, he is a contributing writer to Jadaliye, to Al Jazeera English, to Middle East Eye, and to other outlets frequently writing on the Palestinian issue. He also serves as the international director of an amazing group based in Gaza called We Are Not Numbers. Majid, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Hawaida, for introducing me, and f very much uh, thanks to everybody who have done uh, amazing works to uh, bring the seminars up to uh, for us to speak up and for us to reflect about our uh, roles of uh, to continue fighting the Israeli apartheid in all and resist Israeli apartheid, apartheid every place. Yeah. So tell us what happened with you recently we heard that you had very positive news a victory uh, with regard to a court case that was brought against you uh, in the charges that were brought against you in germany correct yeah correct uh, i might mean, first i would say it's a pleasure to be with dima and mahmoud in this uh, seminar and also with huayda since we also all of us been uh, very much targeted and and it's very hard to work for Palestine activism and uh, normally everywhere in the world. Seriously, Germany, I've been working in Sweden and, uh, and Norway, and it seems like it was a privilege to work there compared to Germany, especially since uh, Germany is, uh, is so much in the forefront of, of defending um, Israel and Israeli apartheid in Europe. Uh, us, I have been um, targeted. Um, if the story maybe start, let's start the story like this. The story is I was in a I was in a place which was a, a university hall, which was a, which hall the those university hall hosted a, a let's say a war criminal. Her name is Aliza Lavi. Aliza Lavi is two think. One is the she is the uh, the responsible one of the direct responsible of uh, deciding the massacre of Gaza 2014. 
and the one responsible also of the committee of uh, fighting BDS in Europe and globally. You know, so this person is in front of me, a person is coming who have survived many massacres and invasions in uh, the for, uh, fronts of um, uh, in uh, the in Gaza. I I I was looking. Uh, I was I was in that seminar, like trying to hear, and also uh, my just I'm sure I would just say interrupt her and 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 stop this hypocrisy that she's speaking. And the idea was two friends who are Israelis for sure, for sure Israelis and Germanys, uh, Jewish Israelis activists. They have more privileges, so they we have those comrades. So they wanted to speak. I really couldn't very much myself be silent on. Uh, at all and all the hypocrisy and lies and propaganda telling that she was saying. So I was, I stood up and just said, hey, you are, what you're doing is um, uh, is wrong and, and your place is not to speak in a university, should be a respectful university, your place in the International Criminal Court. However, uh, we went outside and the smeared uh, started uh, directly by us finding ourselves. We were three people. We found ourselves about 20 people. Suddenly, we also, uh, all the media started speaking about us being protested that the, we were three people. We left after Yanni. We didn't do Yanni. We normally just spoke for about one minute, two. We couldn't, we couldn't really brief uh, by, by listening to uh, war criminals speaking in the university, so went out and the fight start. Sure, the smears uh, goes from all direction and very much institutional level, academic level, uh, like all organizations, like all media start to speak about us, but not to us. And uh, they also want to just, at if they want to speak to us, they want to just attack us. And with that attack, all the BDS movements and the human rights and Palestine activism in Germany, which is continuously uh, very much under attack. And also at risk as uh, Palestine, Palestinian here have been silenced, uh, smeared, uh, persecuted, and and many other like and and they they have really been under attack for over like uh, for decades, you know, in this country with a uh, lots of. Uh, uh, lots of uh, practices that shows a huge uh, anti-Palestinian racism in Germany, just to please and to manipulate any uh, to please the uh, first Israel and to manipulate any discussions toward anti-Semitic uh, uh, issues. So the fact that uh, this uh, our our role was to first uh, say the truth, say truth in front of power. Second is to defend Palestine and to not let war criminals to speak and to speak in public spaces. Third is that we took this uh, as an opportunity to take Israel to court. So we were on a court case recently and with this court case, it went out for three years. And after two days of court case and another day of court case, you know, we managed to, in this time, we managed to, uh, to have our voice heard, I mean, by here, not in Germany only, I and mean, we tried by uh, by the support of our Palestinian activist group and human rights groups and those who believe in the in, in fighting with, especially in a very vulnerable place such as Germany. Uh, we managed to uh, put our voice there to speak our uh, minds and to attack back, you know, because we can't be on defense all the time. We must really attack, and we attacked. We had our story up, but now in also with all the censoring on disabling of accounts and, and news and uh, data uh, online and offline, it's uh, very hard to do that. And I would say it's still hard to get, uh, to, it's still hard, but we, I, would, I would say we succeeded in this. And in the end, we also recently in August, we won uh, this case by going to this court and they couldn't, they couldn't um, really uh, persecute us. They just found, they just gave us, We, I was acquitted and another guy was acquitted who was Israeli Jewish uh, activist and one other uh, girl, uh, Jewish Israeli activist, she was uh, giving the most minimal uh, like persecution, which is 450 euros only to save the face of uh, Germany in front of Israel. So this is how the, the continuous uh, persecution, structural institutional attack even reached on a court level, level in Germany and a Bundestag or a ger like German parliament level where the, where the German parliament reached a point of issuing uh, declarations, not even a law that is not binding 
to uh, just uh, set an anti-BDS motion, which is anti-Palestine motion, to stop any Palestine activism for Palestinians and for uh, for Palestine solidarity in Germany. Uh, and, and that to just say recently that the main uh, political organization in uh, Germany, the, like in, for the political party Christian Democrats, which is Angela Merkel uh, party, they reach a point and they, 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 to make a seminar called Does Palestine Really Exist? You know, and this is where, human, where, where, where the kind of the hypocrisy and the double standard and the like immoral and unethical uh, way that Germany treat Palestinians that uh, went too far to reach such limits. And we will keep fighting and uh, despite uh, the very continuous target, targeting of us in the street, in the grassroots, online and offline. And that's it. Majid, can you tell us, just clarify a little bit, so you and two other activists were prosecuted for what, disrupting that speech? Yeah, we were, this, like, there was a direct action. We disrupted this, as I said, this uh, Knesset member, her name is Aliza Levy, who was a war criminal. Mm -hmm. And that's it, we were just, we, did, we were not, we didn't disrupt as, uh, like we just like went up and just said, you're a war criminal, your place is not here. What you say is a lies. This is human rights uh, reports what, uh, that says uh, what the Israeli, Israeli human rights violation were crimes against humanity uh, and against Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank. This is what happened in the settlement. This is what happened in all these places. We even had a copy of the uh, Richard Falcon Tally uh, report saying, this is a Richard Falcon Tally report that you can also read, you know, and that is that is when we just left after uh, they kicked us out very much and they, they, they hit even one of our comrades, you know, and then they said that we hit them. And then they said that we already disrupt the, this, uh, disrupted the place, uh, the piece of inside the place. You know, we didn't let them do the seminars. And they created a story. Look how the smears also become the great stories that to show that, oh, my God, they even couldn't go outside of the space and they had to go from the emergency uh, place. And that's always a lie and was in all the media without anyone asking us what's really happening, you know. And that is how the how Germany have uh, went how, how German press can like really had low no legitimacy and they they just want to try to make of Israel as a victim as possible and how to how they try to legitim legitimize Israel and delegitimize Palestine and Palestinians. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for also you know, remaining steadfast. And I know that there's another court case happening in Germany right now. Maybe you'll have time to talk to us a little bit about that because I think that's also important. It's more of a proactive one. But before that, I want to bring in Dima Khaldi. Dima is a founder and director of Palestine Legal, which is an exceptional organization doing incredible, much needed legal and advocacy work to protect people speaking out for Palestinian freedom from attacks on their civil and constitutional rights in the United States. Dima herself has advocated on Palestinian rights issues in various media forums. You may have seen her in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Hill, LA Times, Democracy Now!, The Nation, and others. And we are very pleased to have Dima with us here today because we were talking about Palestine and Europe and hoping Dima can fill us in on what's happening in the United States. Welcome, Dima. Thanks, Huayda. It's so great to be on with all of you and really grateful for, for this event. Thank you. Thank you, and we're excited to have you here. And now, so you've listened, and of course, you know about what happened to Mahmoud and also maybe what happened to Majid in Berlin. But what's happening in the United States is also uh, kind of on a different level, um, not any less kind of uh, restrictive and stifling. Could you give us, and I know this is a big question, but an overview because you really, you have kind of one small organization um, and doing so much uh, trying to stand up to these different levels of, of intimidations uh, across the United States. I think we need like 50 more organization, like organizations like yours. Um, but can you give us an overview of what's happening in the United States on this level? of Palestinian rights activists coming under attack? Yeah, you know, it, I, listening to Mahmoud and Majid as well, there are just so many 
um, rever reverberations um, that, that we see here as well in the US. You know, uh, and, and the, real, the real issue is that, um, that Mahmoud's story, right? This is what we need to be hearing. This is what we need to be talking about. Um, what Mahmoud has gone through and what uh, thousands of other Palestinians uh, go through every day. Um, what the occupation means, what Israeli apartheid means on a daily basis. And the entire purpose of uh, the repression campaign we're seeing is to distract us from, from these realities, from speaking these truths, from exposing uh, what Israel is doing and the, the impact it has on Palestinians. Um, so I think that's the fundamental thing to understand here. All of this is designed to distract us from what's happening to, uh, instead of uh, allowing us to, to speak freely and to, to uh, engage in activism, engage in boycott, divestment, sanctions, movement, uh, um, campaigns, et cetera, uh, we're instead uh, put on the defensive and we have to uh, um, defend ourselves against anti-Semitism accusations and terrorism accusations and criminal prosecutions, etc., as Senator Black uh, uh, recounted as well. So, I mean, what we're seeing in the U.S., uh, again, it's really part of a global effort to shut down a growing and uh, increasingly impactful movement for Palestinian freedom. And that includes uh, the BDS movement, um, but it includes a lot of other activism that's happening, um, again, to expose what's happening in Palestine. So it, it and it's happening on so many different levels. Uh, we have uh, in the U.S. what the Palestine Legal really tries to document the kind of repression we're seeing. And the kinds of tactics include everything from uh, criminal uh, sanctions, uh, so criminal prosecutions, to uh, lawfare, which is increasingly happening, lawsuits against academic associates, associations, against um, individuals, against um, you know universities for uh, for allowing activism to happen. Um, and so, so this this use of of legal attacks uh, to distract, to um, you know, to to distract us and to uh, drain our resources um, is, is increasingly happening. And then we have, you know, the, the everyday attacks on individuals. It is uh, amazing to see how many people are directly attacked, smeared um, in, in different ways. And, and there's an entire campaign happening to profile individuals, often students, who are really vulnerable, who are young, who are, you know, don't have resources to defend themselves and who have their entire careers ahead of them. Profiling them online, um, harassment campaigns uh, against them um, to, to try to get their universities to punish them. We have, uh, there's, there's a, an online profile, anonymous blacklist um, that profiles, you know, I think over 2000 people now. Um, and, you know, they, they call the FBI and tell them that these people are, you know, uh, uh, are anti-Semitic or support terrorism or what have you, just based on their advocacy for Palestinian rights. This is the kind of uh, situation we're in where, uh, uh, and, and the intent is to make it too costly, uh, too difficult to advocate freely for Palestinian rights as soon as a student um, makes a, a comment at a divestment hearing on their campus or puts on an event or writes an op-ed in their student paper, they are profiled uh, online and, and their administrations are called, etc. So this is the kind of environment that we're operating in um, just to speak freely uh, about what's happening in Palestine. And the two pillars of that are uh, you know, false accusations of anti-Semitism, now increasingly bolstered by a definition that's being pushed around the world, especially in Europe, but also in the U.S., that tries to label any and all advocacy for Palestine as anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. Um, it, in, in effect, makes 
existing as a Palestinian uh, itself anti-Jewish, right? Because you uh, question uh, Israel's uh, legitimacy, right? As a Palestinian, they have dispossessed us. They have, um, you know, engaged in daily human rights violations. So we see uh, this and and the terrorism framework. Uh, meant to criminalize all of our advocacy and uh, for, for Palestinian rights as the two pillars of this worldwide campaign, really, to, uh, to crush this growing movement. And increasingly, it's the state that is undertaking the repression. So in the U.S., we have, you know, 30 U.S. states that have enacted legislation in some way punishing boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns and enacting this anti-Semitism definition. Um, and we have Trump, of course, the Trump administration um, uh, enacting uh, the, the uh, anti-Semitism definition. And we have the FBI invest investigating activists. So it, it, it is escalating and the stakes are getting higher for all of us. Um, we're seeing that our civil freedoms are being undermined slowly but surely. So it's it's the kind of um, you know the the answer really has to be that that we have to stay uh, focused as Senator Black urged us, um, and and we can't let all of this uh, repression, all of these attacks, distract us from what's really what what what's really at stake and what we're really fighting for here. Yep, thank you. Gosh, I have a list of questions that I can ask you, but you know, I think you covered it from state uh, legislation to court cases to the FBI visiting uh, activists' homes. Dima, you know, I had the FBI visit my home years ago because I called you. I called your uh, Palestine legal, and it was simply based on. Uh, somebody who didn't like the Palestine activism that I was doing, calling the FBI and telling them that I support terror. And this is the, and then you have the FBI on you and all that entails and being put on uh, no fly lists and, and other kinds of harassment. And this is really, as you said, meant to detract, um, get activists to a uh, quiet down, not speak up, and also then to detract from what's happening in Palestine and what happens to people uh, like Mahmoud and others every day. Let me um, go to a, a question that I want to ask all of you, but uh, I'll start with you, Dima, and that is, um, what is the role of advocacy or public attention uh, in kind of fighting this kind of repression? How do you use it? How do you see that it um, it benefits or doesn't benefit? Well, I think it's it's really the most important thing that we can do, um, even as a legal organization. Um, often the law is not on our side, and uh, we do often have to fight those battles. Uh, we're put in those positions defensively to fight legal battles, but um, but the advocacy work is really. Uh, what exposes what's happening, um, and 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 we see that Israel and its allies around the world are fighting this as a narrative battle. This is not, uh, you know, it's not even a question of the human rights abuses anymore. There's no argument um, in terms of you know the the kinds of international crimes <laughs> that Israel is committing. Um, and, and so they have taken this to, uh, uh, it, it has become a narrative battle about uh, who Palestinians are and what we stand for. And so they are trying to define, uh, define us for the world. And so we have to resist that. I mean, that is, that is what's, what's at stake here. Um, they have already tried to erase our, um, our existence. They have tried to erase our, our presence in, in our homeland. They are trying to erase our voice and our agency um, and our ability to define our own um, uh, language and our own uh, uh, motivations, right? Um, so, so the public advocacy is really critical to, to, to uh, shift this narrative and to show what's really happening, what, 
what is behind all of this? I mean, when you have Netanyahu himself calling a U.S. governor and asking him to pass, uh, to issue an executive order, an anti-BDS executive order, there's something um, ar awry here, right? Um, and and so exposing this kind, the, the influence that's happening, exposing the fact that tens and tens of millions of dollars are being poured into this repression campaign around the world. Uh, we have to talk about this and we have to also bring it back mm -hmm. to uh, the fundamental issues here, um, and, which is what Israel continues to try to distract us from. Um, what is happening on the ground in Palestine? What are Palestinians uh, are fighting for here? Um, and, and, and so that's a pillar of our, uh, of our work at Pal Palestine Legal is really to, to work on this exposure to, um, you know, talk about the people who are impacted here. Uh, this is not a, um, you know, this is the way that Israel portrays us um, and those who, uh, you know, advocate for Palestinian freedom um, is, is not uh, who we are. Um, and we have to show that, that human side and, and what, what we're about. Um, because when that happens, you know, when people go to Palestine and see for themselves and meet people, when people have Palestinian friends even and hear about this issue, um, they're changed. And, and, it's, and it's very easy to see it all. And it's very easy to, to become um, engaged in this movement. Right. Thank you. And I just want to pick up on one thing that you said. Yes, like an Israeli leader, prime minister calling governors of American states, getting them to kind of uh, pass executive orders, um, how much the Israeli state is tied into the legislation that is passed in different states, how much Israeli um, or funded organizations are involved in pursuing these lawsuits against activists. This is an example of the, the state itself that is uh, transnationally targeting activists. Um, and it's kind of what I started off in saying is oftentimes we don't look at it, Israel itself that is targeting, not just arresting Mahmoud in the middle of the night from his home, but very much involved in these campaigns that are against uh, Majid in Berlin and, and uh, targeting activists here in the United States. Mahmoud, the same question to you, um, because you talked about the uh, campaign the advocacy campaign that was happening while you were locked up inside and that contributed to securing your release only, I say only in quotes, 19 days after you were taken and held without charge uh, because other Palestinians that don't get the same kind of attention are held for much, much longer. And so what do you, I mean, how do we, how do we uh, address this, I, I guess, uh, in terms of the, uh, disparity between those that kind of get attention and those that don't get attention and how can we elevate this all so that um, we can continue to uh, uh, advocate and help everyone that is unjustly targeted with this kind of repression? I know that's a big question. Oh, you're on mute. Well, muted, yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think we do both. Uh, we in, in Palestine we had like a massive campaigns for Muhammad al-Fiq or for, uh, for many others uh, prisoners who were on hunger strikes uh, because of administrative uh, detentions. Uh, and but still we need to do to do more for for Palestinian political political uh, prisoners. And I think this is not not happening because of Palestinians are not doing that, but because of uh, other other organizations are not getting involved because of the different charges. Uh, uh, and that and that some somehow must be must be changed in in order to change the whole situation uh, toward the Palestinian all Palestinian political uh, political prisoners, which can which 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 lead to thereby uh, uh, I mean admit that uh, all kind of resistance under international law is legitimate for for, uh, for Palestinians, and from there we can take a massive campaigns toward all Palestinian political political prisoners. What happened with me is because. Of the BDS movement, of the huge network, and because of uh, frontline defenders, Amnesty International, and all these HR HR organizations um, united together to defend defend my uh, my right to see the lawyer, and then 
uh, my right to to be uh, to be free. And by that, there was like a massive uh, mobilization. I mean, on the on the gross, grassroots uh, level. And because the BDS National Committee is is, uh, is an entity that represents the vast majority of Palestinian people, all people uh, uh, felt that this is a threat to them. I mean, uh, uh, because they know that I am I am, I am a human rights defender. I do not violent resistance, and nothing nothing more, nothing less. And because of that, all people feel that this is a, a direct threat threat to, uh, to them, uh, whether they are human rights def defenders or even as a, a usual Palesti uh, uh, Palestinian not totally engaged in political on political uh, or human rights work. So, and from from there, there was like some sort of a unity uh, uh, with my cause that led by the BDS movement where it has that that kind of, uh, uh, of, a, of a network that lead to pressure uh, the Israeli apartheid regime to uh, to release me. I mean, I mean, this need more thoughts uh, uh, to think about how can we how can we build such uh, such campaign? We really Palestinian prisoners uh, need that. I mean, at least we can start with administrative detention. It is an administrative detention, and people are just uh, stayed for several months without a charge or without to, uh, being accused of uh, uh, of anything. And they do administrative detentions because people have. Uh, uh, because because they cannot charge people with, with anything and that means that people have done nothing whether it is uh, 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 any kind of, of of resistance and if we can as a human rights organization and defenders can start start from there which is like this administ administrative detention is used to abuse and uh, uh, it's like a, it's like a major threat uh, to all people who resist the israeli settler colonialism uh, occupation apartheid uh, apartheid regime but still, I think this this will need uh, a longer discussion uh, with the HR organization, with the Palestinian, uh, 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 many uh, uh, other organization um, to have at least uh, a plan or uh, or to, or to to plan for to do something for this. Yeah, you're so right, and especially in kind of this day and age, unfortunately, with COVID, we rely on the internet and and even before COVID, you know, relied on social yeah. media to get out information across the world. So we're not so isolated. And now Palestinians, as Andrew had said in the beginning, are facing this attack uh, in terms of their access to social media. And we've had YouTube videos taken down, Facebook posts taken down, active in many, many, many accounts of Palestinians and Palestinian rights activists shut down. So our ability to get out the information and advocate in the way that we need to is being uh, stifled incredibly. Uh, and so that is something that we need to fight back on. And I know in the United States, there is an effort to um, fight back. Uh, that is that definitely needs more people on board, more people uh, jumping on and recognizing what's happening and protesting what's happening. Um, I want to I wanted to pose the same question to you, Majid, but I'm also getting a lot of um, questions from the audience that I want to get your thoughts on. So let me start with saying uh, or asking uh, Majid, how the question is, how does the average citizen support the cause and how are those of us who are artists support? Your thoughts on that? I think the average uh, person's support the cause from a moral point of view. I do think Palestine and Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian, the Palestinian rights is a is a very uh, moral and ethical court that many people can step up into. And the idea is Palestine became a very global movement, and many artists, especially with the BDS movement at the moment, many people find the BDS as a tool to practice their own agency, political agency. Uh, where they can resist the expanding of the Israeli apartheid in and outside of Palestine, you know. So as Palestinian diaspora, you see Palestinians are coming together to uh, very much uh, fight back, you know, because they got their certain privileges maybe, or they also still in a very vulnerable position, but they still do want to keep this kind of love and caring politics toward this land, which is very important. So they have to all the time uh, kind of prove or uh, uh, like prove their connection to, to Palestine by uh, by fighting the Israeli apartheid back. So a regular persons will see Palestine um, 
uh, as a, a way to uh, to uh, to prove their humanity because I do think Palestine became a lot of uh, like a human uh, a human test you know are you a human test in many levels I would say because uh, nobody would just believe that the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians are is more than seven decades at the moment the Palestinian in Gaza is living more than uh, 15 years, like about 13, 14 years in uh, the besieged uh, Palestine. And also nobody could imagine that we as Palestinians are just becoming numbers, you know, that with the, they're, they're trying to dehumanize us and and we trying to humanize us by doing all this political, uh, politicizing our bodies and our spaces and our targeting, you know, and humanizing it in a way where it can be used against all this capitalist, uh, apartheid, colonial, power that has hegemonical, hegemonical discord, the, the, like control over many fields, as like you, uh, Huayda said, the hegemonical discourse over Facebook, Twitter, and so on, that is uh, now we are in the pandemic very much in, and we are not finding any way except to uh, to support it, to, to do to do this advoca advocacy and public diplomacy through it, but we uh, still like we still uh, censored, targeted, smeared. Uh, our account are taking many Palestinian pages are, uh, are really uh, feel the threats of if I speak up so much that I, I might uh, my, my my account can be taken, or I and still the regular citizen feels they I think even a regular citizen at the moment have two three accounts to fight for Palestine. So it is. <laughs> It is. Uh, it's. It's. It's becomes as part of a daily life to find different alternatives to uh, resist back, and also there. Also, a regular citizen will always uh, see Palestine as a way to see themselves uh, as a good as a good humans. You know, as a morally good uh, humans. Yeah. So you would say join some of the advocacy efforts online or take up uh, BDS is what I heard you saying yeah. there. Yeah, I, I see people, we have, uh, what I, I, I always say people have to do something. They, we can't be passive, we just cannot be also just we support. As it's, yeah, like you can't say I'm, I'm against racism at the moment, I'm for Black Lives Matter, but I just stand and I sit on my couch at home. It doesn't work. You know, and many of those people, or I'm just like, I am with the Palestinian rights, but I'm just, okay, you're right and you advocate online, but you have to go to the street. You have to donate. You have to, you have to do a lot more than uh, what also the new neoliberal practices and system does allow you to just restrict, you're restricting your space. And there is, there are the neoliberal practices and system restricting us away from the grassroots and letting us sit behind Twitters and Facebook and so on. We must be in the streets. We must kind of, we must start, we must target them and also not be always in defense uh, attitude. I always say here in Germany, I, uh, when that's why, uh, I wanted to ask about the case we have in Germany where we're suing the Bundestag, which is a very important case, you know? And we're doing that not with this. We in Freiburg also, we're suing, the, we, we, we suing and targeting the municipality there in North Rhine-Westfalen as a state. We're suing them. We sue everybody right now. Before, we didn't learn that. It was like, okay, if you attack us, we attack back. Now we open, we open a battle, you know? Because they have to understand, we're not gonna just stand back and wait for them to attack us. And also, with the many uh, attacks that, and with the many work that comes to us from Palestine, we are an emergency activist uh, connection. Mahmoud is uh, under attack. Let's do something. Then something that happens here. Then Gaza is under attack. All of August, Gaza was under bombardment. The West Bank settlements, annexations. So this emergency, it's distracting. You know, we are a lot. We are many, but we need a lots of people out, uh, outside in the streets, and also many people writing and advocating and doing things. And that is what a regular person at this moment of time, with Trump being up there, all the racist parties are targeting us. I do think very important for us as an intersectional and as a international, like to internationalists to see human rights and to see Palestine in the center of it. Thank you. Right, thank you. So basically do what you can, find what you can do. And just really briefly, you mentioned those court cases. You are now suing these municipalities, suing these cities over the um, banning of BDS in a sense, right? If I understood right. it correctly, they have non-binding right. legislation opposing BDS, and you and 
you know, your group there are challenging these in the courts, right. taking that proactive yeah. approach. That's yeah. amazing. That's it's a, great. Right, yeah, challenging them. They, they, they t attack us. Now we are challenging their moral ability and responsibility, and we holding them accountable for their uh, holding Israeli apartheid in Germany, for example. Because I do think we are fighting as outside diasporic Palestinians. Let's say Germany, we have more than 200,000 Palestinians. 200,000 Palestinians, the biggest majority, is very in a very deliberate situation. They are very under attack for decades. They are not allowed to talk censored, silent, smeared for decades. They're really traumatized. And I'm saying, uh, I'm saying it with a full mouth. I'm really scared about and by myself but i was very kind of depressed traumatized when i came here i i just what what's going on in this country i've never experienced a country such as germany and mahmoud knows i was talking to him yesterday i was like we must attack germany and i'm inviting everybody you know to very much attack germany in in all line because the germany is protecting israel in europe in all in all in all levels and now the anti bds move like motions is taking to poland to czech republic to France, from Germany, and this country, I have to to take. They failed to learn anything from World War II. They failed to learn anything from any place. I would say there are many good people here. We can have partners, but they're really scared to go in the forefront of fight, fighting for human rights and humanity and for uh, clear morality. Yeah. Just to clarify, when you say attack Germany, you mean challenge their policies in yeah, court. Yeah, very much. Advocacy. Um, I know, I'm just clarifying that. Mahmoud, I wanted to pose good. this question to you. <laughs> I wanted to pose this question to you also. What can, uh, actually, let me pose another question to you because I'm getting a note that we are running uh, short on time. Uh, I have a question that is, asks, what are the successes of, what do you see the successes of the BDS movement so far? Um, if, if you just wait, allow me to, to add something on the on uh, on the attacks of BDS and the threats. It's just like very quick. I mean, what, what's happening now? It's not it, what's happening now. It's not only an attacks against Palestinians, but also it's against against everyone and against uh, freedom of expression because preventing people from acting uh, and campaigning for human rights is a grave violation of their of their human rights. And this is and this is happening in Europe, in the US, in Canada and elsewhere, by government adopting resolution that's uh, banning people from their freedom of expression. And because of that, people are now practicing what we call a right to BDS, uh, which become part of their freedom of expression. And uh, I totally agree with Majid that we need to be uh, proactive in uh, lobbying and pressuring government to change their policy toward uh, toward Palestinians uh, and toward uh, Israel as an apartheid settler colonialism apartheid apartheid regime. For successes, I mean, I mean, I can, I can see what one of the most success of the BDS movement is hope, uh, giving Palestinian uh, Palestinians hope, uh, and now this is this is happening in light of uh, the normalization with our with our countries. In light of the frustration in, in Palestine, the ongoing settler colonialism, uh, Israeli apartheid regime turning uh, the West Bank, Gaza, um, Jerusalem into Bantustans and Cantons, uh, the hope left for Palestinians is BDS. And this is according to Palestinians, not only me. Uh, and then come the, the major successes of, of the movement that the movement is, 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 is doing uh, now and, and before. Like, Violia, which is a company that built the light rail in Jerusalem, that it pressured and withdrew, which is a French uh, multinational company, uh, that withdrew from the Israeli market after they lost almost 26 billion US, uh, US dollar worth of contracts everywhere. The last one was in, was in, in, in Kuwait. I mean, um, just like uh, two months ago, there was like the University of Manchester divest five, five million from uh, firms complication Israel occupation and I mean from Latin America uh, to the US to Canada to, to Europe where largest Dutch pension fund divested from two Israeli banks and many many others so so PTS I mean away from the two many successes become very effective and 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 that is like very clear from a very important indicators where the Israeli government 
the really apartheid government considered BTS as a strategic threat. And from Israel, gets the Minister of, uh, uh, of Intelligence calling for a civil assassination, a civil elimination of the BDS uh, uh, leadership. I mean, we know that because uh, they are panic because we are very, uh, very effective. And just today, uh, they are calling of counseling the uh, dismantling uh, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs because it failed uh, to fight uh, the BDS. So we are winning, we are doing well, away from whatever they are trying to, to silence us. They took me for 90, 19 days in a, in a, a total <laughs> uh, a disastrous uh, environment. I'm here. I'm, I'm very loud and clear that we'll uh, keep the struggle, that we will continue. Uh, there's no one can stop us from, uh, from our rights. Thank you, Mahmoud. Um, Dima, I, I had a different question for you, but because I want to cover as much as the of the audience questions as I can, uh, we have one that asks, you know, what do you see for the future? What are the hopes for a two-state solution? And I know that you're a Palestinian, kind of in in exile or on the outside, not actually in Palestine. Do you think about that? Can you comment on? you know, within your work looking for the future towards Palestine, what kind of hope or what kind of solution do you see? Well, um, you know, I think we often get stuck in these one state, two state kinds of uh, conversations. And what what has to happen ultimately is a, uh, is a, a kind of truth and rec reconciliation. I mean, we, Israel has yet to acknowledge what it has done to Palestinians what uh, uh, what what we're living through, and uh, and you know there's they have made us unhuman, inhuman, right? Um, so that so there has to be fundamentally a respect for for humanity here, and any uh, any solution um, has to start there. Um, that you know we are all human beings and we're we're equal and we uh, deserve the same rights and um, you know and it and it has to be a, a resolution that takes uh, that that respects the right of return for refugees um, that uh, that again acknowledges the wrongs that have been done um, and so you know I think. <sighs> Going back to the hope question, what gives me hope that we can get there is seeing the, the you know, in spite of all of these attacks, in spite of the ways that, the various ways that um, hu human rights defenders are being attacked, uh, there, the, the movement is growing and we're seeing, uh, you know, people across the board speaking up for Palestinian rights. And we're also seeing Palestinians uh, and their allies uh, increasingly viewing this their struggle as part of a larger uh, effort to to uphold all of our human rights. Um, I mean, in the U.S., you see the way that movements for racial justice and for immigrant rights and for indigenous rights are are really coming together to say, you know, this is about all of us, and and we can't have justice for one without justice for all. Um, so so that has to be. The basis for for us moving forward, and again, I think the attacks are also across the board. Right, we see at the same time that Palestinian the Palestinian rights movement is being attacked. So is uh, Black Lives Matter, and so are Indigenous protesters. Uh, there's legislation across the board trying to undermine all of our civil freedoms, and again, that's happening globally. So. It's up to all of us to recognize what's at stake and uh, really demand. We we have to demand our rights. We have to fight for them um, in order to, to maintain them. Um, this is really what's at stake. And, and, uh, and in order to do that, we all have to have the courage, uh, as uh, you know, Majid said, to, to be out there and to put ourselves out there and put ourselves on the line um, to, to keep speaking and to fight for um, what we know is right, as Senator Black said. 
Well, I think that is a perfect ending. Not that I want to end, but I'm told that I have to end now. Um, I would encourage everybody to, you know, in the program for this event, uh, the Twitter handle for all of our guests are there. Please follow them, the work organizations, uh, some of the things that they touched on and the information about the court case, about uh, how you can get more involved in boycott, divestment, sanctions, how you can follow the work of Palestine Legal. You can find by following these individuals. Um, and, you know, as, as Dima so eloquently um, summed it up, these are attacks that are happening against all of us, um, forces that are fighting against human rights. Uh, and we have to push back and we push back together by growing our coalitions, by not being afraid and by being out there as much as we can. And certainly by joining us here today, you are part of informing yourselves and getting the resources to help us do that. So I thank you for joining us. Thank all of our guests for sharing their um, information and their knowledge with us for being here with us today. I want to thank Smashing Times and Frontline Defenders and other partners in Ireland for the Dublin Arts and Human Rights Festival. This is the closing event, but all events are available on the Frontline Defenders YouTube channel. Uh, thank you again for being here and free Palestine. You've been listening to the Palestine Podcast, a production of the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.ipsc.ie forward slash podcast. For more news, analysis, events, and ways in which you can take action, see our website at www.ipsc.ie. Thank you for listening, and you'll be hearing from us again soon.